I would say trade with the big T has been one of the most prominent factors behind migration. Also, the nation states of today, India of today, is not the India of the first century. You all know, I mean, India is divided into three now, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. Oman also you know, is not the nation state that Oman is today. Oman uh, was called Mazun and Magan in ancient times. Oman owned parts of East Africa. Mombasa, Zanzibar, they were the other capitals. From the dates actually go for over two centuries. They ruled that part of the world until it was divided by the British in 1861 relatively recently in historic terms. So if we have to look at the Indian Ocean and the india oman relations from a geographical perspective, what do I mean by that? And one of the reasons that oman india relations developed was the discovery of the monsoons. Monsoon is a word from Arabic, mosim, which means season. Yeah? And it's, it's clear now from history that the Indian Ocean was the domain of Indian, Omani, and other, other Arab navigators and sailors from ancient times. And they are the ones who discovered the winds because they used to actually drift along the coast until they, with small boats until they found out, oh, they can cross the ocean. And it's this geographical phenomenon that has influence trade from ancient times. And you can see, you can, the winds take you to Africa and it, they take you to the Indian coast. In fact, un until recent times, it was easier for an Omani to go by boat to India than to go to the far by camel or donkey to Salat. Because it was so difficult to traverse the desert. So they used to get into, and there were no passports and there was no expensive visas, nothing like that. They just came and went as they pleased. So in pre-Islamic times, free trade, rather than political domination, was in the interest of the ruling dynasties. So here is a map showing you both Oman, here, and the Indian Ocean, North Indian Ocean, were ruled by the Sassanid dynasty for over 300 years before Islam. Yeah? And these were the vassals. What does the vassal mean? It means that they were, they were local governors ruling on behalf of the Sassanids. Yeah? So Oman was one of them, Sin was one of them, and the other states, but they went all the way you know, to Sin and Northern India. Of course, trade relations also existed with South India. And there were South Indian communities with Amanis in Basra in Iraq in pre-Islamic times. There is evidence for that, clear evidence. But the difference between the South India and North India is South India was never conquered by the, or, or ruled by the Islamic empire <coughs> as the North was. So our focus today will be on North India. So, you know, with these developments, we have evidence now, archaeological evidence has proved that there were communities from India in 3th century BC, 3rd century BC, living in Dufa, living in Dufa, and in Salut in Central Oman. This is recent archaeology has proved that. Yeah. And we also know that uh, trade existed between the Harappan civilization and Magan, which was Oman going through Balochistan in 3rd century BC. So there was three areas. You had what was called Dilmun, which is here which included, oops, sorry, which included uh, Bahrain, and then on the right you had the Harappan civilization, 
there you had the Mesopotamian and there were trade relations between <coughs> all of them. So we are talking about links and settlements in 3rd century BC. Rakoshaganis and Indians were involved in the, in the so-called Silk Road trade routes. You had, uh, sorry, you had Frankincense routes that were going from southern Oman. Of course, this area was not part of Oman until recently, but from Shahar, from Yemen. They used to go to the Roman Empire, where Frankincense was used in their religious ceremonies. And the land routes went all the way to China, and the sea routes you can see as described. So we are talking about pre Islamic times here. And of course, with trade went all the ideas, and the culture exchanges, and the, the evolution. I mean, you had the Aryan culture, which was by the Sans overtaken by the Sanskrit Hindu culture. And you're talking about centuries of interaction. Yeah. And then you had the Greek invasion, which went all the way to the Indus Valley in the third century BC. So this is the start of the relationships between India and Oman. But with the rise of Islam in the seventh century, two major historical factors combined to link the Indian Ocean area. What actually happened in the Tang Dynasty unified China for 300 years from, six, from the 7th century to the 10th century. And the rise of Islam, which went all the way to the fertile areas of uh, uh, Syria, all the way to Egypt, and then further south, and reached all the way to Spain, westwards and eastwards, of course, <laughs> to Sin, and eventually to Indonesia and the Sumatra Peninsula. Even some most were built in China in, in the 8th century. So what were the two factors? The unification of China and the rise of Islam. What that did was to unite the eastern and western end of the Indian Ocean. And with that, trade developed. So we can summarize by saying that from the 8th century to the 16th century, the ports of Oman and India prospered. Of course, ports changed from Surat to, and of course, the Iranians were involved. The Iranians did not disappear. They were there as rulers and they participated. And as you know, the Persian Arabic culture was implanted in India together with all the other cultural ideas. However, the rulers of the region, of course, wished for peaceful trade. Peace, you know, like uh, Prophet Muhammad wanted. He was a merchant, he wanted peace, and he wanted the trade to flow peacefully without any... But raids on caravans and raids on uh, shipping continue. Yeah? And this was a common practice among the people of the region. You know, especially for those who do not have it, like happens even today. They call it piracy today. <laughs> but raiding... It started and it's continued throughout the trade for centuries. From Oman, you had the northern tribes, which were the other tribes, and the other tribes have always been rulers of Oman. And you also have the, uh, the northern tribes, the Azda from, from Yemen, southern Arabia, and the Banu Salma and others are from northern Oman. So they were involved in these raids. And there is, there is evidence that uh, Omanis and other Indians raided parts of Iran and parts of Sin as early as the year 632. That's the date of uh, Prophet Muhammad's uh, passing away. And this is actually 80 years before the so-called conquest of Muhammad al Qasim and Sin. 80 years before. Yeah. And what happened? The Banu Salman Bilyai, with these beginnings, actually became rulers of Muntar for 200 years from the 8th to the 10th century. No, and they were not the only ones, because you had the Banu Munabba, who were also an Arab tribe, who ruled Branwabad, and they called it Mansura. Yeah. And this is, you know, for at least two centuries of rule of uh, Omanis in Muntar 
and the one who never in Mansoor. The one who saw in the 10th century, there were Sunnis, but they changed their allegiance to Ismaili Fatimid Caliphate, which was established in Egypt. That was again for commercial reasons, because the Fatimids were trying to control the Indian Ocean trade. But this state of affairs of peaceful trade changed with the arrival of the Europeans. The Portuguese <laughs> came, and they came with their religious ideas, and with their gunpowder and firepower, and they had a mentality of, uh, you know, Islamic homophobia is nothing new. <laughs> it started at that time. They basically, expelled a lot of the Muslim communities. The Portuguese expelled a lot of the Muslim communities from the, 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 the area of influences and they introduced what is called the Karachi system. The Karachi system was a form of uh, toll payment. If you wanted to trade, you had to pay money to the Portuguese. A, 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 a toll payment. So if you want your ship to cross, you have to pay money to get it cross. And the same thing for caravan trade. Yeah. And the Portuguese actually frequently expelled prominent merchants. Um, and this led, of course, to new migrations. People went from uh, where they had relations with other merchants. But the Romani rulers at that time, they also had relations with Banyan merchants and Koja merchants. The Portuguese, when they were in, in, uh, in India, and in, uh, I'll show you the extent of the Portuguese. This is the extent of the Portuguese. And you see the green is where they had their trading posts. Always run the coasts. Yeah. In Ireland, in Mogadishu, Kamba, Zanzibar, yeah. Sopopra, and in the Sin that I've already talked about. And of course, they were also in Muscat from 1550 to 1650, over a century. So when they were there, the most important port was Tata. It was very cosmopolitan, and there is evidence that Khojas from Tata at that time were the most prominent and the most numerous community living in Muscat. And their agents in Tata owned warehouses in Muscat at that time, 1550. Yeah? They owned warehouses in Muscat and they were exporting all sorts of other things, mainly uh, commodities like cotton goods and uh, cotton textiles, Kashmir shawls, and things like that. In 1555, the Portuguese sacked Tata and destroyed it. And this also caused a, it was a bustling metropolis. It was totally destroyed. It set on fire by the Portuguese. And many of many the you know, the historians record that there were renewed migrations of the Khojas and Banyans, not only to Kutch, but also to Amman and other trading ports in the Indian Ocean area. Interestingly, many of many and uh, other historians record that the Portuguese were finally expelled from Muscat and that was on 23rd January 1650, with the help of an Indian Banyan merchant called Naruto. Naruto was actually an agent of the Portuguese in Muscat in the 17th century. But the Portuguese commander, who saw his beautiful daughter, <laughs> proposed to marry her. And he refused. And he, he, he actually gave help to the, to the uh, Yarubiza dynasty which is the Benedictine before the other side, before the current dynasty. And it was through his help and the Banyan community that the Portuguese were expelled from Muscat. The Omanis pursued the Portuguese and defeated them on the Western Indian Ocean. I mean, this is the great, great statement. How can somebody who is in Rusta, in central Oman, come to the coast, beat a European power on the seas, and that was done with the cooperation 
of the Koja and Indian merchants resident in Moscow. There's no doubt about it. And we have actually, the army built a strong navy and uh, they are said to have actually have built ships in Bombay and other places in Gujarat at that time. And the, the Abu Saidis who came to power from uh, the 1740s pursued the same thing. With the founder of the Abu Said dynasty, Imam Ahmed bin Said, was a merchant himself. He was a coffee merchant in Suha. And the Arabis <coughs> appointed him as the Wali of Suha. And his influence grew because he had connections with the mercantile community of Masqab and Matra, who helped him. Yeah? And there is evidence that with his struggles, he, he actually, uh, Oman before the Al Busaidis was occupied by the Shah and the Persians. And with the help of the trading communities, both Banyan and others, he was able to get rid of the Persians from Masbat, from Barqa actually, and he assumed the rulership after the Arabs. And just to give you a brief, uh, this is the thing of the fact that I was talking about before, and note the closeness of Buj, which is in Kutch, and what is now Karachi. Fatah is actually now incorporated in Karachi, and this is the area of Sindh that I was talking about. Yeah, I'll come to that. I just wanted to show you this first. So the Arab dynasty was from 1624 to 1729. And the Portuguese were expelled in the 1650s, the Persian occupation from 1790 to 1740s, and the Abu Saidis, the current ruling dynasty, from 1740s onwards. Okay. So, Sultan Ahmed Ahmad, we are told that Omanis were building ships at Bombay and repairing old ones to the value of 500,000 rupees, and they possessed 50,000 tons of shipping. Yeah. This is in his. Uh, the first ruler I talked about was Hassan bin Sa'id. His son took over from him called Sultan bin Ahmad. And Sultan bin Ahmad actually visited Sindh himself and established a personal dimension of the traditional link between Oman and Sindh. And he also established connections with Tukwi Sahib of Mysore, who was also resisting British domination. And the, and the Mysuri delegation lived in Oman in the 1780s. But what was happening on a wider scale, trade was being diverted to the Cape Route, you know, from the Gulf and from the Red Sea. But what that actually meant, that the merchants of the region, instead of, in addition to supplying the African and the Asian markets, had now the additional opportunity of supplying Europe and USA. In the main ports of that time, this is, we're talking about early 19th century, because the Americans were involved in trade, the Germans were involved in trade, the French were involved in trade, and the Americans. The Americans actually, their influence died down because of the Civil War in 1861. But they were very active in Zanzibar and Mosul before that. So, just to give you an idea, of what the commercial expansion, this is from different sources in, in the 18th and 19th century. So just to read them, this is 1775. There are such immense quantities of goods that there are not warehouses to contain how. This is Basta. Zanzibar, which is to the Omanis and to the centers in Zanzibar, that the ships from India in preference go to lay their cargoes for distribution <coughs> all around the coast. End of uh, 18th century, the people of Muscat accumulated unimaginable wealth. And their ruler, Sukhara bin Ahmad, became the strongest <laughs> and most respected in the region. And last one, in the mid 19th century, this is interesting because in the Zanzibari market, what is uh, taken by the Americans or the English goes to Bombay and to Muscat. From Muscat, trade companies may still find their way to America. If not, they go to Calcutta or Bombay. So this was the relationship. This was a huge expansion of trade at that time. 
And if she, it is at this time, at the beginning of the, the 19th century, that new waves of migrations of merging from Sindh and Kutch intensified. And why was that? There was famines and earthquakes in Kutch in 1803, 1812, and 1824. And a lot of the merchants who had links, established links, migrated to Muscat and Zanzibar. However, despite these natural disasters, we are told that Mandri and Kutch was described in 1818 as the principal seaport and the most populous in Kutch. In its brisk trade with Muscat, Bombay and Malibar, 800 boats were employed and large quantities of dates were imported from Muscat. During the first decades of the 18th century, Mandri imported twice as much ivory from Zanzibar and supplied three times cotton goods than Bombay or any other port. Yeah. Mandri was also the original home of Shivji Taban. The Shivji Taban is a big, big influence in, in, in Zanzibar affairs. He had personal relationships with Sultan bin Ahmad, and he also had personal relationships all the way from uh, his successor to Sa'id bin Sultan, to Majid, to Barash, and he was the custom master Periodically, both in Zanzibar, he was actually called Swali in the end because of his connection to the Swali tribe. His family is known as Swali in Kutch. So he's one of them, Shivji Topan. There is other names like Gopal Moji family, who was also very influential in Zanzibar. And they controlled what actually the customs, how did the customs master work? Customs masters were actually an open purse for the rulers. What actually happened, they took the customs, revenues, but any money demanded or requested by the ruling family, not only the Sultan, was given without question, and accounts were made through the receipts of the customs from time to time. In good times, of course, the custom master made profit. In bad times, the Sultans were in debt to the custom master. And the latter was, more common, I would say. Yeah. So with the arrival of the new community that I described, you know, I just want to come to a point that has been mentioned in Western uh, writers, and they say that the Banyans did not bring their families outside. But actually, you know, is this really true? Because we know that Narutam in the 16th century was there with his family. Yeah. And I have another quote here. This is from Nabo, he's a Danish explorer who came to Muscat in 1765. And this is what he says. In no Mohammedan city, Muslim city, are the Banyan so numerous as in Muscat. The number in the city amounts no fewer than 1,200. He lived here, he came here, he saw them. Yeah? And he wrote this. They are permitted to live agreeably to their own laws, to bring their wives hither, to set up idols in their chambers, and to burn their dead. 1765. So as I said, the Banyan community was just one of the many groups in Oman's regional trade. But here is an important question. In the 19th century, did these Indians, did these Banyans think of themselves as Indian or Oman? The Omani rulers, insisted they were, and they called them, they are our own people. They are my people. They actually pleaded with the British, leave these guys alone. They have been here for centuries. But of course, the British would have their way. The British insisted that anybody coming from India has to be under their, their, their jurisdiction. Including the Sindhis, because the Sindhi conquest, uh, the British conquest of Sindh was in 1840. And these people have been in Tata since 1550. But they insist that no, they are under our protection. And through the nationality question, through the anti slavery per se, slowly, slowly they took over the trade benefits that accrued to the regional traders. And India itself gradually became a, under British domination. So just to give you an example, a few more examples before I finish off the activity of, of the trade, I've just got some pictures, and they say pictures speaks a thousand words. 
that this works. Yeah. So this is in 1842. Landing horses from Sultano in London. They were used to export to London. Horses. Yeah. So this is an example of the Hamburg Zanzibar Treaty. There were German, there was actually a, a treaty with the with the German Hanseatic states in 18, 1856, if I remember right. This is an Arabian horse given to Queen Victoria by Said bin Sultan. This is Wait Frenza, which is now Wait Frenza, in 1844, before the treaty between France was signed. This is a mission that was sent in 1840 by Said bin Sultan to the USA, to New York. So these were the connections. But actually what it meant, Britain regarded them as their rivals, obviously. And uh, because, you know, they wanted to control the trade. And when Oman started going into diplomatic and formal agreements with them, the British didn't like it. There was another reason why they went out of their way to dominate. Just to give you an example, in Zanzibar, in East Africa, what used to happen? It was family connections. Yeah? So this is an example of Richard Burton writing. And look at the names. This is not only on the coast, this is also in interior Africa. Nagadamji found the custom in Zanzibar. At Pemba, it's Pisu. At Mombasa, it's Lapidas. At Pangani, it's Rikandas. And you can see by the names. Ramji resides in Bagamoyo. And he said, I, I, I can hardly say I connect my blood is on the street. So this was the relationship. But it was beyond that. Because what actually happened, as I mentioned, the customs masters like Shivji Topad and Gopal Mochi had very close relations and they were the first for the Sultans, but in return they were the customs masters. And actually this relationship has existed to this day. With this, uh, and, you know, the names that come to, uh, to mind, I always imagine if Chief Shevji, Jairam Shevji, the Sayyid Topad, the Tensipa Shotam, and also there were not only Banyans, there was Suleiman ibn Hamad, who was a big trader in Zanzibar. There was Abdullah ibn Salim al Barwani, who was also a big trader in Zanzibar. And then in the 20th century, you had Yusuf Zawabi, Zubair al Houthi, and Zubair's father, Habib Murad, my grandfather, and so on and so forth. They all had huge, and it didn't have to be by them. They were from all communities, but they were all traders. That's the important So what actually, this tremendous activity that I've shown, as I said, it, it created a challenge for the British. And the, for various ways, and succeeded in the end to the exploitation of the nationality question, the anti-slavery crusade to dominate both the modern and So this is basically the past. But what about the future, given this cemented relations, cemented for centuries. Now you have on the one hand India, you know, with its massive human resources. They have reached the moon already. <laughs> you have got the uh, technology, you've got the skill of its people, you've got the know-how, that's on one hand. You've got Aman, you know, who is who has actually leaped from the Middle Ages <coughs> to the 21st century in 50 years, 60 years. I was a boy in the 60s in Mokra. And you know, there was, as you all know, there was three kilometers of road and we had nothing. So this is where we've come. So we're looking to the future with this continued cooperation and hopefully to contribute to human civilization like the world 4,000 years ago as I talked about. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Dhruv Kureji. I'm grateful to His Excellency Amit Narang for giving me this opportunity to talk about my family history on the first session of this lecture series. Indian merchants in Muscat are commonly known as Banyans. This is the picture of my great great grandfather, Ratan Sikoshota. This still is at there in our office. So if you want to visit sometime, you can probably catch my father. <laughs> here is a picture of our family tree in which the names are written in Gujarati. It was updated in 1952, the year in which my father was born. Let us look at the entire lineage. I am Drew. Here's my father, Vima. My grandfather, Ranshor Das, Lalji, Ratansi, Purshota, Damodar, Thakarsi, Natha Makkar. I'm proud to say that I am the 10th generation woman and will now give you a quick glimpse of the historical reference dating back to more than 200 years, starting with Natha Makkar. This document has been obtained from the Maharashtra State Archives in Mumbai. It is a memorandum of exports of iron and steel to the Persian Gulf in the year 1838. It lists the name of Natha Makkan as one of the leading importers in Muscat. His name appears several times in the manifest. If you notice it here, the name has been changed a little bit by, I guess, the British accent. Natha Makkun. Again, again, and we have here again certain third. This is just the first page, so we can see much more into this. Datansi Pushatam himself came from Kutch Mandvi to Muscat around the age of 16 in the year 1857 to work for his uncle at his ancestral firm, Messrs. Natha Makta. He worked under the guidance of his uncle for 10 years, and then in the year 1867, established his own business in the name of Ratan I'm sorry. In the book, Oman since 1856, Professor Robert Landon of Princeton University describes Ratan as a shrewd businessman, a leading importer and exporter in the 1890s and an arms merchant. As the business expanded, he started acquiring a number of properties in both Muscat and Matra. Now we will look and see if, if we can find some good documents and prop photographs. This document shows an auction property in Muscat being purchased by Ratan Singh on 22nd June 1881. We can read the name out here and the date was also on here. Unfortunately, I think parts of the Arabic piece has been cut off. This is the initial correspondence from William Hills Jr. to Ratan Sipurshota. The first line here says, You have been recommended to me as a party who is in a position to pack for the dates. This is how the dates trade started for us. On this part. Dates were packed and exported to the United States just in time for Thanksgiving in the month of November, as we all know. Such invoices were made for the export of dates. Ratansi Purshota maintained an excellent uh, relationship with the American consulate. This is a note of thanks 
from the U.S. consul on receiving a fruit basket from him. We were talking about Magan, Professor. Uh, even back in 1897, we can notice here, I'm using the name Magan. And uh, Banyan, British subject. So they combined it up as you said. This is a check issued by Ratansi on Mercantile Bank of India, Bombay, in 1911. Since there was no formal banking system in Muscat, such checks were easily discounted at the Muscat money market to raise required funds for trade. We can notice here a number of endorsements are seen at the back. It's just the back side of the same. We can notice here Short and Hammer, Short and Hammer in London, uh, and Moritz Magnus, which were the European exporters of arms to this region. Ratan Sipurshatam was also a shipping agent for booking Hajj passengers from Muscat. This letter, dated 29th May 1919, shows the existing fares for passengers and I guess freight as well. Yes, there you go. Passenger and freight. We talked about the customs franchise. The customs franchise was being auctioned by the government. This document shows that in 1889, Ratan Siposhotam won the bid for the customs franchise by paying Maria Theresa dollars, or Kursh Franzavi, as we know, 115,000. The firm successfully won the bid for several years. This is a map of Old Muscat showing the location of the palace, as it shows, the wharf right here, the Al Farda. It's been written over on this side, the Farda right here. And the British political agency, forts, both Mirani and Jalali. And at the bottom, just below, you can notice right here in the center, Beit Ratansi. Now here comes my uh, favorite picture. Ratansi lived in Muscat, where he built Beit Ratansi. It was a magnificent office and residential complex close to the palace. A sketch of the Muscat Harbor from the book by Ruth Hawley, wife of the British ambassador. This sketch and postcard show one of the premises of Ratansi adjacent to the British political agency on the Muscat waterfront. I believe this was the one. Here is an impressive photograph of the management and staff of Messrs. Ratansi Purshottam in the year 1910. Later in the year 1955, the Indian consulate was looking for a suitable premises in Muscat. They approached my grandfather, Ranshur Das Lalji, to lease this property. For some reason, this did not materialize, and the consulate leased the property of uh, Haji Bakhar Abdul Latif. After a few years, the Banyan Community School was housed in Beit Ratansi. Many of our senior community members will fondly recollect their childhood days attending school here. And now we shift on to Matra. To the original one, all of that went for the for Matra when Muscat was being redone. Now this is uh, the Matra waterfront. So Ratansi Porshodam and the firm they built another property on the Matra waterfront to facilitate the expanding dates trade. The dates auction was at Nadi Matra, 
and our date packaging factory known as Khajur Karkhana uh, was in close proximity. Commuting by boat from Muscat and Matra was extremely difficult and time consuming. Uh, so going to do this by boat would have been very, very difficult. They had an ingenious idea. Ratanti somehow managed to set up a private telephone line for quick communication. And my father has played with that thing before the house was torn down when he was a child. So he remembers the, the magnets and all things somehow. We didn't get a chance to see any of those things. This is a postcard uh, which shows uh, the farda, which is the customs jetty. You can see it right here. You can see the gunny bags and uh, loaders. And on the jetty here is our home. They're so close to each other that it was very convenient for, for business. Just quickly get through for whatever you need to get onto. This was a beautiful house with a long balcony showing a fantastic view of the Matra Bay. So you can see, which is on the old house, which has now been demolished. But you can see the Cornish on the side, on this side. Uh, on the left, we can still see, as it still is, the gorgeous Matra Fort stands very tall at the back. Backdrop, I say. Uh, we can notice uh, my great grandmother, Javir Bai Lalji, my grandparents, Ranshur Das and Madhuri Bai, and that's my father at the back. Oh, all right. Can I see it? <laughs> okay. Okay, I see it. That's a Toyota Dyna blue color. Right. Right. Oh, that is a 99 Mazda and 78 model owned by my dad. Okay. In 1979, my father decided to take a very difficult decision to demolish this old heritage home. My mother used to ask her, I said, why didn't you, you know, take some time before you decided to, to break this? We would have loved to see it. He said if she came there in those days when everything was being rebuilt around the area, he may not have she may not have decided to marry him in that area at that notice, at that time. <laughs> so this was the modern five-story building which was constructed in its place. Uh, we presently continue to live in the same house on Matra Cornish and enjoy the breathtaking view of Port Sultan Qaboos. Of course, uh, if we go from the house and look outside, you can see His Majesty's yachts parallel. It's probably one of the best view for us, unless you go up to the fort. We're going back to the dates factory, the Khajur Karkhana. This massive date packaging factory had several date pressing machines. More than 100 Omani women were employed at the peak packing season. A daily wages register was maintained with their names and the amounts paid for them. Several large warehouses were built around the factory. If you go to the Matra Souk, you can still see this gate right here. This is probably later in, in, the, in the 60s this year. This farmhouse was located in an approximately two acre plot called, sorry, close to Tavi, Tavi Banyan. It was used as a family retreat for the family. Pictures here show a feast being celebrated by the community on both sides. In the center, we can see the family relaxing on the swing with my father holding a camera in his hand. This one. Members of the community were allowed to use the farmhouse for uh, cel to celebrate special occasions with their families. After the demise of Ratan Si Purushottam, 
His two sons, Nancy and Lalji, continued the business on the same lines. Here is a certificate of registration in the name of Lalji Ratansi. It very clearly here says British subjects are required required such a certificate for travel within the Persian Gulf and also on the back they would require the names of who was along with so his wife was there and his niece and also had an em one of the employees going along so if they had to move they had to go all the way through Persia in those days at least what the Brits used to call it that unfortunately my great grandfather Lalji died at an early age in 1932 when his son Ranshor Das was only 12 years old. His wife, my great grandmother, Javer Bai, and her son were living in Karachi for his education. Lalji's widow returned to Muscat with her minor son. You can see him on this boat. We're not sure whether this was going to or back from his travel. She was forced to assume the responsibility of the family and to consolidate and streamline the, the business. It took several years to sort out the succession process for the large number of assets owned by the family at that time. <coughs> My grandfather was respectfully known as Bhaiji Seth in the community. He took great care and fondly preserved the important documents and artifacts of Ratansi Purushottam. <coughs> Professor Cal, 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 Calvin Allen, sorry, for me I call him Cal, so it's a little odd for me to have to write it out here, uh, spent months organizing the archives with my grandfather, and I think they just went on talking, 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 and we've seen uh, what this has come on to. Here are a few pictures from family, uh, the family house, sorry, from the family life, which we had together. They had together, sorry. He loved, he loved to listen to the BBC World Service news re regularly on the radio. In the bottom left, you can see him near the Motisar temple in Muscat. And in the bottom right, they also called him Bhaiji Set, as we were saying, standing with my father, Vema. My grandfather decided to construct a row of shops for commercial use in front of Beit Ratansi that we talked about in Muscat. Some of the prominent tenants who rented these shops were Haridas Nancy, Capital Stores, Nasser Abdul Latif, and Kanti Nagardas. My grandparents are performing the Vastu Puja or the initial ceremony to inaugurate these shops. That's my grandparents, and I think that is my dad. Yes, that's for, that's for sure. This note of thanks was given to my gra grandfather for donating 400 historically important documents to the Ministry of National Heritage under the auspices of his Highness Said Faisal bin Ali Al Said. This is an older commercial contract, about 120 years old. I'd like to just try and point out uh, three things here. In Arabic, for those who can read this, Ratansi bin Purshottam al Banyani. Uh, at the bottom, we have the stamp of His Highness Sultan Faisal bin Turki Al Said. Says the date here 1322. The stamp is different, but the date here says 1322. And for accounting purposes, notes were in Gujarati here at the bottom. Most of our properties in Muscat were acquired for the construction of the palace complex. This is the document, one of this is one of the documents from those days.
Here we see His Highness Sayyid Tariq bin Taymur al Said at a formal dinner with Foreign Minister <coughs> Neil Innes and Dr. Tara Chand after signing of Indian Oman diplomatic ties. My mother found these pictures in our Mandvi house after the earthquake in 2001. They've been blown up just to get there here. So these were the three we talked about. An exhibition was held at Beit al Zubair to celebrate India Oman diplomatic relations. His Majesty Sultan Haitham bin Tariq al Said observing the ex exhibits and signing the souvenir from my father on the left. We would really like to express our utmost gratitude to His Majesty Sultan Haitham bin Tariq al Said and the wonderful people of Oman for their warmth and hospitality that Oman has given us. It has always been our first home. Thank you. Thank you so much.